Welcome back. There has been growing interest in nuclear energy as the world seeks a transition away from coal energy. Accordingly, on Viewpoint today, we explore the prospects of small modular reactors with a panel of experts. I have Professor Chong dong from Chungang University. Professor Chong, it's been a while. Welcome back. Yep. Thank you for having me here. I also have Mr. Thors Schoenfeld, the head of Danish startup Seaborg, live on the line. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Mr. Schoenfeld. Thank you. It's a pleasure to, to participate. Right. Professor Chang, we'll start here then. Let's mm -hmm. begin with the basics with mm -hmm. regard to small modular reactors. What are they? What are their merits and perhaps potential drawbacks? All right. Yeah. Uh, small modular reactors. You know, uh, as its name tells us, it's a small reactor, so that the power capacity of a small modular reactor is uh, usually uh, less than, you know, a 300 megawatt electric. You know, in these days, the commercial reactors are very large, more than the 1,000 megawatt electric. Compared with that, small modular reactor is small. That's the first one. The second characteristic is the modular type, which means that most of the systems are manufactured and assembled in the factory and are delivered to the construction site. And then the construction you know, uh, you know, uh, process is quite simple. And um, you know, uh, furthermore, uh, the merit of the uh, SMR is that you know, if you need the 500 megawatt electric power capacity, then you can assemble five modules of reactors if the uh, reactor power is 100 megawatt electric, so that uh, you could accommodate what you need using the SMR technology. The drawbacks of the SMR is still is uh, rather expensive. So that uh, the challenges of SMR is that you know that's the uh, to prove the economics of uh, its design. Yep. Right, I see. And against that backdrop, Mr. Schoenfeld, your startup has been developing a new generation of smaller nuclear power plants with priority placed on safety. Do you care to elaborate? Yes. So, um, so we are building a fundamentally new type of nuclear reactor, a molten salt reactor, where we have a, a uh, fluoride salt. I actually brought a piece here. It looks like this. Um, this is a rock in nature, and uh, the nuclear process uh, happens inside this rock in a molten stage uh, when, when we heat it up. And, uh, and, and uh, this salt then captures these uh, radioactive materials, so you get a very, very strong inherent safety. So you cannot have a large-scale release outside of the site, uh, the site itself. So we say that the accidents stay within the fence, and that, that is even the worst, uh, worst case scenarios, which is acts of war or terrorism. So everything stays within the fence. And that's very good because then we can get to some of these developing countries that very much need nuclear power today. So, so uh, that's what we're working on. Right. Professor Zhang, staying with what uh, Mr. Schoenfeld has just uh, said, fears about terrorism targeting nuclear power stations mm -hmm. are quite prevalent in mm -hmm. modern society, especially given the situation over in Ukraine. And that being said, what are the risks of such a scenario with regard to small modular reactors, do you think? Well, you know, if you're talking about the terrorist attacks, you know, uh, nuclear power plant basically include the, uh, uh, the consideration against the uh, terrorist attack already, you know. You know, uh, in the uh, 911 attack, you know, which happened in the year 2001 in the United States, you know, after that, all the nuclear power plant was asked to prepare for the terrorist attack. The most severe one is the aircraft crash using the aircraft and, um, you know, uh, crashing the uh, nuclear power plant. So that nuclear power plant, after that, nuclear power plant was asked to prepare a such an event. They call it the flex safety guidelines using the uh, mobile equipment heavily. And the most important thing is that, you know, con containment structure must be designed to endure uh, such an you know, uh, you know, attack uh, from the aircraft, aircraft crash. If you're talking about the uh, Ukraine you know, crisis in these days, that's the uh, you know, uh, risk from the war. If you're talking about the uh, risk from the war, nothing is perfect from the viewpoint of safety. You know, missile, if a missile attacks the nuclear power plant, of course, it will cause the uh, you know, problems, hazard to the uh, you know, uh, vicinity around the nuclear power plant. But Think about the LNG, you know, uh, storage tank. You know, if you rely on the, the uh, gas power plant heavily, then you need the, a lot of the uh, LNG tank. And um, missile attacks the LNG tank, then the explosion happens. Then the, compared with the, such a risk, with the, uh, what happened in the nuclear power plant, then you're gonna, you, you need to have uh, some balanced uh, 
uh, perspectives on the risks, then uh, you can make a choice. Right. And moving forward, Mr. Schoenfeld, earlier this year, your company sealed a deal to work with uh, South Korea, of course, on exports of floating nuclear power reactors. Do tell us a bit about this particular deal and perhaps your decision to work with this country. Um, yes, let, let me start a little bit in a different place. Um, we, we are a company that is very focused at these developing countries where electricity demand is growing very fast. Um, as these countries are coming out of poverty, they need a lot of energy. And if you look in Southeast Asia, uh, these are regions with uh, poor wind and poor solar conditions. So it's very hard to do this from renew renewable energy sources. So they absolutely need nuclear power. Um, so we are building this as an export industry. And when you look around the world, uh, you will see that, uh, that Korea is one of the most impressive nuclear industries of the world, but also one of the most efficient and, and highly skilled maritime industries in the world. And, and we want to deploy these on barges so we can build them where, um, where we are good at building, uh, which is in South Korea, and then export them to these developing countries. So, so it's a big export opportunity, and, and we are very happy to work with, uh, with South Korea. Right. Meanwhile, Professor Chung, some pundits say that disposable, disposal, that is, of mm -hmm. nuclear waste remains a concern. What do you say? Well, uh, that's right. You know, uh, the SMR, I don't think that's going to be a solution to the, uh, you know, uh, high-level radioactive waste, which is the uh, spent nuclear fuel, because the current generation of SMR is based on the same technology, which is used in the uh, currently existing nuclear power plant because they are, they are using the water as the energy transfer uh, you know, uh, materials. But in the fourth generation reactors, which is being developed by the Seaborg, the, the molten salt reactor, which is being developed by the Seaborg, is one of the fourth you know, generation reactor, we call it. And um, such reactor systems could be a solution to the uh, uh, you know, a high level uh, radioactive waste because it can transmute you know, uh, long lived high level you know, uh, radioactive materials. That's why European Union's taxonomy, you know, uh, you know, emphasize that investment on the uh, fourth generation reactors. And then let me talk about the, the risks from the spent fuel, you know, nuclear spent fuel. You know, you're talking about the, uh, there is uh, some risks from nuclear spent fuel, and uh, that's, the, uh, uh, that's going to be uh, some hurdles to the SMRs. I, I agree with that, but um, uh, you put the, uh, you know, spent fuel, you know, underground, you know, 500 meters deep in the underground. If, if, you know, uh, in the worst cases, even in the worst cases, if the uh, uh, risk uh, can, in order to have the risks from the spent fuel, you know, buried in the underground, it takes at least the, uh, you know, more than a couple of thousand years. But talking about the risks from the climate crisis, if we are talking about the 50 years or 100 years or something like that, the time scale of risks are quite different. So that what's, what's going to be your priority? To you know, uh, to be prepared for the uh, risks that you are encountered. So right, the immediate danger then. That's right. That's right. right. Mr. Schoenfeld, speaking as an expert, looking at the situation here in South Korea from the outside, and you mentioned this earlier as well, what more can you tell us about your assessment of nuclear power prospects here in South Korea? Well, I, I think uh, South Korea has a proven track record in, in nuclear power and uh, I actually believe that uh, South Korea is one of the greener countries on this planet already simply because of the use of nuclear power. Uh, nuclear power uh, from, from when it was built is actually also providing a very cheap electricity source. And, and uh, it is very safe, uh, so, so there's not really any problem. Of course, somebody has to handle the waste eventually. And this is where uh, these advanced reactors, for example, can, can come in and, and help with that. Um, but, but looking from the outside, South Korea is very impressive in nuclear, and, and I, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, South Korea was uh, a vital, had a right, vital role in enabling UAE to start uh, getting into nuclear power uh, just a few years back. And that's actually the first time a new country has entered nuclear power for many decades. Uh, it's very hard to, to just suddenly get nuclear power, but it's something we need all around the world. I think it's also something that is needed in South Korea, but, but that's not my choice to, uh, to make.
You're right, but hopefully the people here will heed your thoughts then. Uh, Professor Chang, as a scholar in the field and yourself, what can you tell us about the advances being made here on the local front with regard to small modular reactors? Well, uh, we in Korea, uh, we have uh, very good experience in the uh, small modular reactor. We have already uh, you know, a small prototype small modular reactor, which is called, the name is the SMART. Uh, it's a 100 megawatt electric capacity. But uh, uh, the trouble with the, the uh, smart uh, was that the, the economics, as I told you, you know, uh, so that uh, we, you know, the, government, the Korean government, uh, they planned, you know, uh, a new project to develop, you know, innovative SMRs. That project will be launched in the uh, early next year. Uh, through uh, their project, uh, we are aiming to lead the uh, SMR uh, technology in the world, but um, we will see what's going to happen. You know. We'll keep our fingers crossed yep. for that. Yep. Mr. Schoenfeld, does Europe have in place, do you think, a productive support framework for the development of small modular reactors, do you think? And it's an interesting question. I actually think uh, Europe is very good with uh, fundamental research, where uh, South Korea is way better at uh, putting things from research to the market. And uh, we are a startup, and we have not been able to get a lot of grant financing so far. That might change now when the taxonomy has changed in Europe. But, but so far, it has been very anti-nuclear environment in Europe. But the ground research has been done here. So, so it's a really good base to develop these advanced technologies. Um, in South Korea, you have the smart reactor, which is a conventional reactor, which is scaled down, which is very good. But we also need these advanced reactors if we want to have a a future with more nuclear and, and with new applications. And we, we are actually financed by private investors, uh, mainly here in Denmark, but, but around the world. And these investors are willing to take the risk of developing this technology. Uh, so I don't think this is Europe so much as it is uh, a, a foundational research combined with a good, uh, healthy way to uh, commercialize products. Right, I see. Professor Chang, mm -hmm. SK, uh, the South Korean uh, conglomerate here, recently made an investment in Bill Gates' uh, Terrapa. Do tell us about efforts by local conglomerates here yeah. for joint ventures on the nuclear power front. Yeah, actually it was uh, kind of a surprise to me when I heard that the SK uh, made a decision to uh, invest on the uh, natrium reactor, which is being developed by the Terra Power, sponsored by the Bill Gates. But um, there are uh, other, you know, uh, several other companies, private companies investing on the uh, SMRs. For example, you know, uh, GS Energy and um, Samsung Construction and Trade Company and uh, uh, Hyundai Engineering, they also investing on the uh, uh, SMRs and uh, making the uh, cooperation with the uh, foreign SMR you know, uh, developers, uh, mostly the US companies. And um, I hope that you know, uh, they're going to make uh, the uh, investment and uh, cooperating with the, uh, our own you know, uh, Korean uh, design too in some time future because we are now you know, uh, starting the, uh, developing our own designs. And the reason, I think that why they are investing in the uh, foreign you know, companies for uh, you know, SMR development, development is that you know, uh, they, are looking at, they, are looking, they are looking those SMRs as a future business opportunities looking at the uh, carbon neutrality, which is coming to us uh, by uh, 2050, then the, there, are f there are few choices only. Only few choices, you know, and among the uh, choices that they, that they uh, can have, you know, uh, SMR is uh, probably the, the most promising. That's why they made uh, such a decision. And um, CBOB, I hope that, that they're going to have uh, some opportunity in the future. But the, my, if time allows me, then um, I, you know, I'd like to ask the uh, uh, CBOB that uh, Denmark, for example, Denmark is uh, very good in the uh, wind power and um, the, uh, pushing the uh, renewable energy as uh, the uh, national uh, policy. And uh, I, it's very interesting to me why CBOG uh, is, uh, is uh, you know, emerging in the, uh, Denmark and uh, looking at the uh, you know, molten salt reactors, which is very you know, uh, fancy, but the uh, fourth generation reactors, which is uh, somewhat far from... Uh, renewable energy? And, and far from the uh, current, you know, uh, front line, you know, uh, SMRs. Yeah. Right. Maybe we should take this opportunity to ask Mr. Schoenfeld on his thoughts regarding that. What is your answer, yeah. Mr. Schoenfeld? I, I don't think one excludes the other. I really think that uh, nuclear power and wind goes very well hand in hand. Um, there are regions of this world where the wind is very good. In, in Denmark, we actually have the North Sea, uh, where we have almost constant wind. It's almost perfect condition for wind power. And of course, we should build wind turbines there because it's the cheapest energy in that region. 
In other regions, they have hydropower, and some regions they have good solar. These, all of these resources should be exploited. We, we, are, we are talking here about global warming. We need to decarbonize. We have been looking at, the, at more and more carbon coming into the atmosphere for a long time. We really, really need to start working on this. And I don't think we can spare any expense. We need all the different power sources in the regions where we can build wind cheaply. We should do that in the regions where we cannot build wind and solar. We should build nuclear. If, if fortunately for us, that's most of the world where wind and solar is not the best energy source. But, uh, but I, I don't think one excludes the other. Right. And Mr. Schoenfeld, let's end with perhaps a few words then on the future of small modular reactors as we seek a sustainable future. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Well, we absolutely need it on this planet, so, so we have to solve this problem. But I also think it's become more and more clear that this is a technology that's coming. In Seaborg Technologies, we now are, are more than 100 people. I think we are 130 people now working on this. We have uh, very large partners such as uh, Samsung, which we are very proud of and, and, uh, and really good collaboration there. Uh, so we are moving forward very fast. But you also see Terra Power getting a big investment, and there are many others around the world. I think right now it's, it's not a question of if these advanced small modular reactors are coming. It's a matter of who will succeed because it's, it's not an easy challenge to solve. And there are many different approaches and not all of them will work. So it's a matter of who will succeed and who will be behind those winners. Right. And staying with that then, Professor Chung, perhaps we could end with your words on the future of small modular reactors here in the country and perhaps a better support framework for such efforts to that end. Well, at the, the, the future of small modular reactors, well, uh, you know, uh, in order to make the uh, carbon neutrality, you know, renewable energy comes first, but then renewable energy, it has uh, intrinsic vulnerability, which is a trans, you know, uh, which is the uh, uh, intermittency. So that in order to make up the, that weakness, it, it needs a partner. The partner should be uh, nuclear, other than that we don't have any other choices. You know, in the, in the previous you know, uh, years, you know, uh, people think about the, uh, using the uh, gas power, but the gas power generation, it, it makes the uh, green, you know, uh, greenhouse gases so that uh, nuclear energy should be combined with the uh, renewable, that's going to be a solution. If you think uh, that way, then SMR will be uh, you know, a key in the future. Yep. Right, to ease our carbon footprints then. That's right. All right, Professor Chang from Chungang University, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. And Mr. Thol Schoenfeld at Seabog, thank you very much for your insights early this morning right. there where you are in England, uh, in uh, Copenhagen, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.